Hey friends, we're here with another episode of the Power of Nine podcast. I'm your host, Aaron Eggert. Today's guest is a doctor of chiropractic that has transitioned to lead one of the Twin Cities most popular craft breweries, and I have a feeling that's just the beginning. Let's dig into all that and more with my friend, Andy Rizvold. Andy, welcome to the show, man. Hey, thanks for having me, Aaron. Yeah, I'm super happy to have you. I think, are you at the brewery today? I am, yep. We're yeah, good. Uh, right now tucked away back in our uh, wedding venue space. Oh yeah, we had an event there and it was solid. Uh, that's a yeah. beautiful space back there, kind of tucked away. Mm-hmm. Nice. Uh, all right, so uh, before we get into your journey, um, let's uh, address your pronouns. How can I refer to you throughout our conversation? Uh, he, him. All right, great. Thank you. Uh, okay, let's get started. Where'd you grow up? I grew up West Suburbs, uh, Mound of Minnesota. Um, I'm uh, born and raised there. My family still lives out there. My mom's still in Minnetrista. My dad's in Wyzetta. Uh, my twin sister's out in Watertown. So my whole family's, you know, West Suburbs. Yeah, uh, creep, creeping yeah. out by me almost. I'm out in, you know, Lester Prairie and Watertown's getting pretty damn close. Not, not quite to where you're at, but close, right. close. Yeah. 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 Um, what was, what was childhood like, uh, living on, on that side of town? Yeah, it was good. I grew up in a household with my mom was a entrepreneur as well. She's a wholesaler. Um, so would buy for manufacturers, sell to, uh, as big as people like target. Um, my dad was the chief of police in YZ. So had the yin and yang there of my mom being like ultra creative and, you know, a driver and super fun uh, work-wise. And then dad, who is, you know, the disciplinarian, uh, still like a great father and the discipline is like all a good thing, but that yin and yang game was uh, really good. So, um, the, so wholesaling, what type of stuff did your mom wholesale? So imagine walking into like a uh, typical Northern Minnesota, like souvenir shop, uh, everything from candles and pillows and blankets and sweaters mm-hmm. and painting, all that's like, she filled those stores. Um, she still runs that business. It's called priorities too. Um, and obviously with the internet, I mean, she's seen her business change from the nineties to 2022 significantly. Um, but she's still changed. She's super agile, super creative, and she's still, uh, she's still rocking and rolling. So super, super proud of her. I've learned a ton from her. Yeah. I think, uh, so am I thinking like for target, like some of that stuff that's maybe even the, in the dollar spot when you walk in the front and they've got all that stuff that's right around a dollar or $2 and it's that kind of stuff too. Yeah. And she's not, doesn't necessarily, uh, sell the target anymore. She used to, yeah. um, now it's yeah. a lot of that smaller home goods stores. Uh, yeah. Kowalski's is a good account of hers. Like, so imagine walking into a Kowalski's and everything from, you know, gift cards to, you know, sweatshirts. Yeah. Gotcha. All right, cool. Mm-hmm. Um, and then with the, the, so you've got your mom who's an entrepreneur and then your dad, who is the, the chief of police in YZ, which, you know, I got to believe that the chief of police in YZ is very different than being the chief of police in a lot of different <laughs> cities. A little, a little and, different. And, yeah. Yeah. So what was, what like disciplinary and give me some examples of like, what what kind of structure that he built within the, within the family? Yeah, I was, uh, I should say he was, of course, with my mom, but it was just a setting high expectations and setting, setting, uh, not necessarily like, I'll be home by 10 or else, like, you know, not that at all. It was, you know, just setting a high expectation of how we represented our family um, and represented our last name. And um, my parents, like to this day, say, if you do something, you do it with risible pride. Um, Mm -hmm. So that my dad's the youngest of 10. So that was ingrained to him from all of his brothers and sisters and his dad, who also was an entrepreneur. Um, and then my parents passed that right along to me and my, my sisters. Yeah. So, you know, I always like to address the nature versus nurture thing. So I, I you know, just in getting to know you, uh, I got it. I feel like it's almost like a little 50, 50, because I think you've got <laughs> some internal drive, you know, and, and oh. you were, you were born with some of that, but I think also, you know, with that structure that your, your parents gave you, and then also the entrepreneurial spirit specifically on your mom's side, I, I, right. I mean, it's a kind of a cop-out answer, yeah. but it's kind of a, it's a 50, 50 blend almost. No, it really is. I mean, in my, I don't think you get one without the other, right. It, mm-hmm. At least to do anything successful, you need to have the, the structure and the discipline and the focus and hold yourself to uh, high standards. Um, but you also need to, have it within you to to explore and be creative and and do those things so it's like you're born with half and then for me I I, did, I wasn't 
born with the discipline focus. My brain goes a million miles an hour in all sorts of directions. Mm -hmm. So that's something I had to learn and, uh, you know, be nurtured in. Yeah. Do you, so were you a troublemaker at all when you were a kid, like being the police no. chief uh, kid, like, or do, no, you know, I, yeah. Rizvold pride. I was lucky. I was lucky right. to have a twin sister who was a party animal in high school. So like, <laughs> as long as I wasn't worse than her, I was in great shape. It was, yeah. uh, it was, uh, yeah, it was, I skated by pretty, pretty quietly through high school. Yeah. What was your, what, what were your, uh, activities in high school that you were into? You know, the typical, typical, uh, baseball, basketball, football sports, uh, only sport I played all the way through, uh, high school was basketball. I joke, I had a, I got to practice with the team every day and I had a front row seat at every game. I uh, didn't play a ton myself, but you know, being part of a team builds, builds those bonds for life. Um, yeah. and then I was part of a business club called DECA. Um, hmm. I think there's quite a few high schools that participated in it now, uh, but it's a, it's a great high school club for kids to kind of understand the nuances and the, and some, you know, basic aspects of entrepreneurship and business leadership. Yeah. Were you a good student? Uh, you know, I skated by, I mean, I, I didn't apply myself hundred percent. I was, if I was not on the B honor roll, that was like the expectation, like B honor roll or better. Yeah. Um, so I was either A or B honor roll, but I never, I was never a student either that was losing sleep over studying. Right. It was, it was always, you know, projects due on Thursday, I better start on Tuesday, that kind of thing, <laughs> which is, which right. isn't a good thing. I mean, there's, I, school was always just school, right? Even through college and grad school, it was always, there's always, it was just school. I never, never looked at school like a job. And I hope my kids one day look at school like, oh, this is my job. I want to excel at it. Yeah. So you went uh, and transitioned into St. Cloud, you know, for your undergrad. And was that what was the plan in high school for you to go to St. Cloud? Did you have a plan or did were you was it just like, I'm going to St. Cloud and I'm going to figure it out? Yeah, that was it was more so that it, my both my parents went to St. Cloud. I was accepted to do like a number of colleges and just with based on comfort with my parents uh, saying they went there and had a great experience. And a few of my friends are going there. I chose St. Cloud um and but didn't have a plan I wasn't like oh, I'm going to graduate this time and then I'm going to get this shot no plan at all it was uh get there and kind of figure it out have some life experiences and um see where the passions really see what see what fires me up a little bit and then you when about what year in college did you start to think about going down that path of of chiropractic yeah, so I started the biomedical sciences route in St. Cloud uh, my saw junior year. Uh, so that would have been 2008, I think. Um, and that was like all the prerequisites for all sorts of different, uh, all, all sorts of different added schooling. Uh, chiropractic was the only one I was focused on then. Uh, but it was like your organic chemistries and microbiology, all that, all that fun stuff. Um, so I graduated St. Cloud with that as a minor, uh, small business management and entrepreneurship as majors, um, and then went to chiropractic school here in Bloomington at, uh, Northwestern. Yeah. And what is, uh, what was that experience like going, going from, I think what probably would be a little bit of a larger school in comparison, right. To the yeah. transitioning to grad school, um, and really with a specific focus on, on I mean, yep. I want to, I want to unpack the chiropractic side of things so much because I've never been to a chiropractor, although I probably need to, because my back is hosed, but I do think that there's, there's that blend. And this is my perception and, and let's maybe just, you, we can debate about it or whatever is it's almost like 50, 50 business and, and healthcare. Right. And so yeah. ch chiropractors are really trained well on how to run a healthy business. And so it is, a, a, you, you find a lot of really good entrepreneurs um, where I'll compare it to almost like dentistry where, you know, a lot of people go into dentistry and they might just be really great dentists, but they're just shitty business owners. Right. And yep. it just takes them years to figure it out. And they got to work under somebody else's wing for, for a good long period of time, just to get it the business side. Uh, I, I just said a lot of stuff there that, uh, and we, we went a lot of different directions. What is your thought on all of that, that I just said? Yeah, I would say a lot of, a lot of people graduate, both, dentistry is a great uh, example and analogy, but in chiropractic specific, a lot of people graduate with the intention or with the hopes of, I'm going to hang my shingle and people are going to find me. Um, 
And that's just not the reality to be successful. So to really be successful in that business, you you have to be a, a smart business owner who uses their time extremely wisely. Um, you have to know how to market yourself. You have to know how to treat your patients. You, it's a, you're wearing a lot of hats in that, uh, in that role. Mm-hmm. Um, and similar to dentistry, the, the, also the only way to really, to really ha- have success in that industry is to own your own practice. You can't work for somebody else in that industry and expect to have the quality of life that your student loans that you just graduated with, you know, require you to have, I mean, yeah. you have to, you have to make a significant amount of money to pay those things off. So to do that, you have to run a pretty efficient uh, and smart business. The trap a lot of people get into with, I'll say dentistry, um, say dentistry, chiropractic, a lot of those are, I mean, a baker's off a baker shop or a brewery. Right. A lot of people have the passion to be the baker or to be the chiropractor, or to be the dentist or to be the brewer. Um, they're doers, uh, but they don't have the ability or the vision to see beyond that. They, they think patient will come, they'll pay me money. I'll bring it home. And that's, they, there's a, so much disconnect and there's so much more to it as you and a lot of the people listening to this know. Yeah, I think almost um, one of the thing that I th- things that I think chiropractors do well is that they understand. So there's a there's a thing I always say about like if you're running a small business, you have to be a marketing company that happens to do X, right? And yep. so you have to be a marketing company that happens to do chiropractic. And so yep. I think you you kind of figure that out early based on on you know the things that I've read and our conversations is that that you need to get people, you need to get butts in the door and there needs to be brand awareness. And then you need to kill it on the backside from, from a chiropractic standpoint, an experience standpoint. A hundred percent. Yeah. My first clinic uh, was on the sixth floor of a building in the warehouse district, the only with no parking and no working elevator. So to get somebody who had horrible back pain to find you is, was a job. Um, Then like the only, the only landmark to, tell people where I was because how are you going to say like I'm in this building at sixth floor no elevator good luck was hey I I'm a uh, Sharon Alley with sex world uh, you can park in that alley and then you can <laughs> I'll meet you downstairs I'll bring you up and we'll go from there uh, but that's how I started I started with zero patients um, I, I grinded to get that first chunk that first chunk was super important and from that chunk the networking arm the networking just right. you know expanded crazy I found from that network I found an incredible office in the north loop uh, that had a ton of parking for free. It had a first floor entrance, no elevator needed, no stairs needed. Um, and I went from, you know, zero, zero patients my first week in, in March of 2015 to by March of 2016, I was seeing a hundred ish or so patients a week. Yes. Um, it just was, but it was, con- that was my life. That was, I was every, wake up, go to bed. That was it. Good. Uh, so um, I want to get back into that. I'm going to, I'm going to pause on that and, and rewind a little bit. So it, when you were, how long of, of, how long was grad school? How many? Yep. Three, how three and a half years. Yep, and, three and, and a half then, years and it's full on. It's, there's no breaks. It's just three and a half straight years. Oh, really? So no, su- yep. no summer or anything like that. And then I think um, they, had, they had like two or three week breaks between trimesters, but it was right. straight through. How about, uh, do they like other, um, is, did you have to do clinicals and things like that to where you were shadowing and working with other chiropractors? Yep. Your last, about your last full year, a giant chunk of your schooling is like split with internships. Okay, cool. Yep. And then did you, did you stay in the twin cities when you did your internships or did you get to travel or, or what did you do? For I sta- those? Yeah. I, I stayed in the twin cities. I spent uh, like nine months or so out in Wyzetta uh, in a clinic. And then I spent the last three or four months uh, down in the, um, Skyway. Mm. Okay, cool. Yep. All right. Uh, we can now, fa- now we can fast forward to, uh, you, you know, where you were, uh, when you started your chiropractic firm. And so how on God's green earth, do you figure out how to go from, to manage that many, did you have a team or were you doing, were you, so there, you managing I mean, all these patients? Yeah. So it, again, that's just, and that's not that there's other clinics who do it far more efficiently, uh, and see, far more people. I felt really comfortable that hundred to 150 number. Um, our visits weren't in, incredibly long. I did a lot of my vast majority of my business was a, uh, like a membership model. So, mm. um, patients would pay a, a monthly fee and they would be able to come X amount of times per week. 
um, which was really hands off for them. It was really hands off for me. It managed itself on the financial side. Once their credit card was in, it just ran every single month, kind of like a really cool uh, networking group I'm a part of right now. <laughs> nice. Yep. Uh, yeah. Works nice. It's, yeah. It's, it's, it's a good, it's a good model. It it's <laughs> makes it so you can be really, really lean, as you know. Um, if you have good systems in place from the yep. beginning, you can you can run pretty lean without a ton of help. The most help I ever had was one part-time uh, office manager, and that was it. Was was the the plan when you created this and started this business to eventually exit it and sell it, or did you see yourself when you started this of being this was part of the long game? Yeah, no, I looked at it as part of the long game. I looked at it having, so the brand was well-adjusted Minneapolis, which then turned into well-adjusted Minnesota with uh, my buddy, Mike, who opened a uh, well-adjusted Eden Prairie. Mm. Um, and the plan was to essentially franchise, but not truly a franchise, have a few locations scattered around the Twin Cities. Um, that changed a lot. I mean, as, as you grow, you realize what's going to work long-term and what's not. Um, I started to feel like it was growing a little too fast, like it was gonna, it was too busy and getting too much of a like a flash in the pan type feeling, yeah. uh, where it needed to be toned back and brought some better systems in. And that's right about the same time I met uh, Neil Crane, who owned um, Core Health Chiropractic in Uptown in Plymouth. He wanted to come into the North Loop. I was right at the stage of being big enough where I needed some true help with like. I wanted to get in the network with insurance it was never going to be something I was going to do alone. Um, I wanted to grow some systems I would never be able to do on my own. And mm-hmm. uh, the time I wanted to do it right, right when I was having those growth struggles, he, I met him, we started talking seriously. And then we opened core lifestyle clinic in the North loop, which to me is the mo- one of the most beautiful clinics I've ever been in. It's what, what he and I and Dr. Taylor Myers created in that North loop spot is just a really beautiful, beautiful clinic. Where is that located? Uh, 221 North First. So if you're familiar with the North Loop, uh, it's that building right between across the street from Fairgrounds and Spoon and Stable. So it's it sits right between those two landmarks. Um, if you're familiar with it, right across yeah. from where Ribnick Fur used to be. Yeah. Yeah. We, you and I, the first time we met, we grabbed a coffee at, Fair, uh, at Fairgrounds and you're like, hey, yes, I got to get going. Yeah. I got I a patient that's <laughs> going to be there at whatever, nine o'clock or whatever it was. Like, and and like we literally three minutes. Just had, <laughs> yeah. Right. You had to walk across the street, which like, yep. yes, how convenient. Well, that's just a super convenient location. Um, yep. So are you still involved in that business? Yeah. So I practice there not often as, uh, as I used to. I used to be, you know, 40, 50 hours a week, uh, COVID came, COVID really forced my hand to choose between time, how, how I was going to spend time between the brewery and the clinic. Um, the brewery needed me far more than the clinic did. Uh, and my passion had started to fall away from the amount of hours I wanted to spend at the clinic mm-hmm. as well. So right now I'm at the clinic about six hours a week is all Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 7am to 9am. Uh, allows me to still scratch that itch, uh, which I love. I love the networking piece of it. I love helping my patients. I love having the relationships I've built uh, with those patients over the last five, six years. Um, but it also allows me to explore some other things, spend some time at the brewery uh, and be a lot more flexible with my family time. So with the, was it an acquisition or was it a merger? Yeah, we more or less merged uh, yeah. originally. Um, and then as of the end of... 2021 i'm no longer part of an ownership there at all anymore now i'm uh essentially an independent contractor there uh and so i still get to treat my patients they get to make a sliver of money off the revenue i I bring in um and i get to bring in whatever else is left so that's great yeah do you what what is um What is one lesson that you learned in that process of that merger with them that you you think maybe people would would find interesting? That's a really good question. Um, The grass is always greener, right? What we what we built there is an incredible, incredible thing. Would I and I would do it again, um, but I not necessarily always push for more. Like sometimes it's okay to to settle back and just be a master of what you are really good at and then put people around you to do the more instead of you trying to do it yourself. There's, yeah, there's think, a tendency. go ahead. 
Uh, I think this system's, you know, you've sent, you said this multiple times when you were talking about like the maturation of the businesses, the systems and process side is so important in order to scale. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, I think that was pretty evident in the way you described it. Yep. Yeah. And there's a tendency for people to always to want more. And sometimes the way to get more is to have other people do it for you, as opposed to you trying to do it yourself. Yeah. If you spread yourself too thin and something you're not an expert in it, you do things half ass and everyone loses. So that that's the my that's one of my bigger takeaways from it. You know, I think in in a lot of small businesses, people are evaluating like what they want to get out of the business. I think COVID maybe is is flipping people's paradigms on that of like, you know, what do they do they really want to scale this business to be something big and, you know, like maybe at some point in your life you were thinking of having you know, 50 different franchises and, and, you know, it being that type of model where sometimes the grass isn't always greener on that side of things to where uh, you maybe wanted a little bit more congruence. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. I mean, well, you then, see it with people, you see, I, like I have friends who are don't own their business, but they're always pushing themselves to get the next raise to get, get the next promotion. And at some point you really just want to look at them in the eye and give them a hug and say like, it's okay to push cruise control and really enjoy your life for a few, few years instead of, you know, pushing for that next big thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, <clears throat> which is a great segue because you did push for the, <laughs> the next big yeah. thing. Hey, let's take a quick break and hear about a few of our supporters. If you're an entrepreneur or married to one, you likely have a shared vision on your future, but there's uncertainty on how to get there. That's where the team at eWealth Partners comes in. They see you as a dynamic duo, and as fiduciaries, they're committed to helping dynamic duos like you design a financial plan that aligns and empowers you. Navigating the entrepreneurial journey shouldn't add stress to your relationship. It should be fun and exciting. Visit eWealthPartners.com to learn how they help couples like you plan for their financial future today. eWealth Partners, holistic financial planning for entrepreneurial couples. Investment advisor services offered through Advisor Net Wealth Management. eWealth Partners and Advisor Net Wealth Management are not affiliated. Regardless if you're a startup just figuring things out or a medium sized organization with a full team, having a legal partner by your side is crucial. Siler Law is fiercely loyal to their clients and are passionate about removing headaches and roadblocks that can pop up during the growth of your business. Whether you need general outside counsel, are planning a business transaction, or even need someone to help guide you through the estate planning process, the team at Siler Law are the advocates for you. Visit SilerLaw.com to learn more. Siler Law, where experience meets pragmatism. If you're a business owner wanting to save money on your overall real estate costs, I want you to give Carlson Partners a call. The team will help minimize your risk exposure and help you leverage the market to see maximized benefits to your next lease, purchase, or disposition. They've advocated and negotiated for hundreds of companies and saved millions of dollars in real estate expenses. With over 75 years of experience representing business owners, let them help you save time and money on your next real estate negotiation. Visit carlsonpartnersllc.com to learn more. Listen, people, everyone needs a bank. Not just any bank, a good community bank. From personal needs like checking and savings accounts to business services like financing and M&A support, the team at Flagship Bank is there to provide you with the assistance you need so you can spend less time thinking about your finances and more time enjoying what your money can do for you. To learn more, head over to FlagshipBanks.com. That's FlagshipBanks with an S dot com. Member FDIC, Equal Housing Lender. Flagship Bank, investing in you. Okay, back to the show. So I, as you were, as you were, I think it like the, the overlap in time frame is probably when you were working on and on that transition um, yeah. out of the chiropractic world, you're transitioning into the craft brewing world. Um, and, you know, that's one thing that I, I find fascinating. Like, um, so let's talk about Forgotten Star, your, your um, craft brew business. I've been there many times. You've hosted us for a, a Coalition 9 event, but then also I've been there for your curling event. And I mean, you guys have yeah. such an amazing space and we'll talk about the space uh, actually and some of the words you've won rec recently soon. But um, talk about that process of like from when you had the idea of wanting to get into that game and then finding the right people to partner with and then how to allocate and, and raise dollars. I think that whole world is fascinating. Yeah. So this was 
this must have been like 2017. Um, still, this was when the clinic was at its busiest. Um, but I always had an itch to want to that just like what we just talked about. I had a horrible itch of always wanting to do more, 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 more. And one of those mores was a was a brewery. Uh, so we kind of like ha ha half heartedly started to put together a plan um, that started to get much, much, much more serious um, through that process. It was me and another uh, another group of people doing this. My wife said, do you none of you know how to brew beer? Like you should probably figure that out. And she she had known Matt Ace. Uh, he dated one of her roommates in college. Um, she introduced us via face, Facebook Messenger. I, Matt and I actually just read our, that the first Facebook message we had together. He was the head brewer at Free House at the time. Yeah. Uh, so we grabbed a beer and started telling him some of the ideas. He's like, "Yeah, I, I'm kind of interested. Like, you kind of have an idea here." And it got more and more and more serious. Um, the original group kind of fell apart, but through that original group, we we really learned a lot. Uh, we met a couple of investors. Uh, we met one investor through an attorney. Um, he was, he had just sold uh, a business. So he was really itching to do something very different and kind of, I shouldn't say as a hobby, but I mean, he's, he's very silent in this investment. So it is kind of a hobby for him, which is great. Um, he was very interested in still doing a project with Matt and I, uh, he introduced us to another friend that he knew through church. They brought, uh, they invested in us. We, so that's 2017 that started, 2018, that original group kind of dissolved. And then December of 2018, I, me and Neil at the clinic signed our construction paperwork to start constructing our clinic. And like three days later, four days later, we had a loan, a loan paperwork and a lease paperwork in front of us for the brewery. I was like, holy smokes, 20, 2019 is gonna be kind of busy. And then uh, like two, two weeks after that, my wife told me she was pregnant. I was like, oh my gosh, uh, 2019 is going to be really busy. So January to November of 2019 was pretty insane. We start, we opened, we opened the clinic in January, opened the brewery in uh, November and had a baby in October. 2019 yeah. was a, was a, was a big one. Yeah. That 20, and, and we all know what happened in 2020. So yeah, uh, that, what kind of effect did that have on, on the business, uh, you know, I, I think we talk about this on on every little podcast. I don't want to get into like the whole COVID bullshit, but what I do want to just, you know, you're in a world where it was really hinged on people coming yeah. and visiting. So how did you how did it you was, manage through that? Yeah, it was. I mean, stressful, of course, but we, I mean, we opened in November, and I, I looking back at it now, it sounds like a joke, and I don't mean it to, but we didn't know any better. We didn't know any different, right? We opened in November that first month, month or two was honeymoon phase. Like people, it, people were so excited to see our tap room. It's such a unique space. People were like very, very supportive right away. March came and I mean, it was, we've never had a March that we had business. We had no clue what a shutdown was really going to do to us. So we just leaned into it. We were already super lean as it was. We only had two full-time employees um, that we were paying and no one else was getting paid in the business at all outside of those two employees um, and a couple part-time people stay through, but we, we didn't know anybody better. So once we were allowed to open up again, we try, we put a really positive spin on it and we try to do it every single day of like, Hey, April 7th is our best April 7th we've ever had. April 8th, we set another record, best April 8th we've ever had. We got to do that every <laughs> single day of that year. Yeah. So instead of these, and I feel horrible for them, but instead of these other businesses whose employees were comparing you know, July 5th of 2019 to July 5th of 2020, like that's a pretty depressing way to look at it. Cause you know, you're not right. making, not making as many tips. You're not selling as many burgers or beers or anything. We got to, we set a record every day that year. It was awesome. Yeah. yeah. And then, <laughs> that is and, then it, it, and it forced us to be really creative with our marketing It forced us to be really creative with our space. That's why we have curling rinks out there. That's why we have a huge heated tent and stage like COVID forced our hand on investments. We never would have made, um, but we had to right away, like right out of the gate, we said, well, we, we need to be an attraction that people feel really safe at. So that's where ice rink was year one, curling rinks mm -hmm. were year two. And that's what we'll do every year going on. We bocce ball cords, tent, all that stuff. It was, it was absolutely necessary. So what is one thing that you're, that owning a craft brewery uh, that most people would not think of as a huge challenge of yours? I think people always, the one we think people think is a huge challenge is people. Oh, how hard is it for you to find people right now, especially given the staffing issues? We have the opposite, yeah. opposite 
for us. I mean, we, people want to work with us, which is awesome. The one thing that I would say, the one thing that I would say is harder than I would assume was in the beginning for sure was time management. I, you, I don't think people realize there are some amazing breweries in this town and for people to decide to visit yours specifically takes a ton of work, it takes a ton of creativity, a ton of good marketing. Uh, it takes Matt, my partner, making incredible beer and it has to be done over and over and over again. The consistency of all of those efforts working together is much harder than I thought it was going to be. How many beers do you have uh, on the board right now? Yeah, we do 12 beers on tap at all, almost all the time. Uh, every once in a while, I'll drop down to 10 or 11 just based on production, and how that's all flowing, but usually 12 on tap at all times. So just recently, and uh, in, I, I, in we we cheered you on for this, and and this was a big deal. So you, so Forgotten Star, you and the team yeah. won best tap room. Is it in the world? Out of like it was 600? Uh, cool. It was insane. It was coolest tap room in the world award from a, a outfit called the Craft Beer Marketing Award. So it's a it's an award award company that or award body that only. Uh, that focuses on the marketing side of brewing. Uh, 391 breweries applied, 600, I think they said 600 some odd judges and we won best in the world, which is super Crazy. cool. It's a, it's a, it goes to show that the video work we've had done for us through uh, people like Visual Captive, they're on, they're on LinkedIn. If you look at them, they do great work. Mm -hmm. uh, our, again, our creativity with not being afraid to add curling ranks and heated to all this stuff. It, uh, and then the building's history is truly incredible. So they, and combination of all of it was pretty neat. Good to see. So uh, I want you to, so one of the things that I love, your, your beer is great. Uh, I love your building. I love the space. It feels so good. Um, but also what I love about the building is the history of the building. Uh, just just break that down for me a little bit of like what, what the history of that building is and where it came from. Yeah, so it's really hard to do without the visual. So if people are listening at some point, just go to ForgottenStarBrewing.com. Uh, there's a history tab, hit that. Um, it's a 13,000 square foot building. It's the last remaining 13,000 square feet of an original structure, which was 1.8 million square feet. So there's just a tiny sliver of what's left. Um, what they used to do here was build weapons for World War II, um, specifically these giant turret guns uh, for Navy ships. If you're really good at producing in World War II, so there's 86,000 buildings that produced for the war. Mm -hmm. um, if you're really good, you got an a star award called the excellence in manufacturing award from the Navy and the army. And if you maintain that excellence for six months, they would give you a star to another star to go with it. Uh, so this building of the 86,000 4,200 got that first award. Only seven other buildings in the country got six more stars. And this is one of just two buildings left standing. So the only other building that's been as awarded as this one is general motors in Detroit. No other building has been awarded more that's still standing other than those uh, us two, which is incredible incredible it's it's wild yeah it's beautiful you when you pull in the parking lot the first time we toured it you're driving through this brand new industrial park and you're like where in the hell am i going and you turn this last corner like right up against the railroad tracks you turn this last corner and these two giant beautiful stacks are sitting there and the building just hits you right in the stomach it's like oh my god that's where i'm gonna go have a beer like that's yeah. sound that looks awesome already yeah. so i joke i have the easiest job here my job is to get people here their first time because once they see the building, they get our get service from our beer tenders and then have Matt's product. It's a five-star experience, one after the other after the other. You see the building, five-star experience, five-star service, and then incredible award-winning beer. Yeah. Oh, I love it. And and I I gotta say, man, well, uh, the 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 talk about real quick the the mural that you have painted on the oh. wall and the significance of that. Yeah, so Allison Hunsley, uh, she's a muralist here in the Twin Cities. Uh, she's starting to do stuff all over the country, which is I'm super proud of her. Mm. Um, yeah, she mirrored what they used to do here. So this is the boiler room. So they would literally shovel coal into boilers and that would power be the power plant of the whole facility, 1.8 million square feet. Um, so she mirrored that, that action of shoveling coal into the boilers with Matt, uh, you know, stirring, stirring uh, grain in a wort. So... We're trying to mirror what happened then and what, what we're doing today. And we, met, we try to mirror their, their mentality with, with our slogan, which is excellence and efficiency. We want to have an excellent product and we want to do it really efficiently. Yeah. All right. We're going we're gonna to tell people how they can get a hold of you, but I'm going to say it right now and I'll probably say it again later. If you haven't been to Forgotten Star, uh, you have to go there. It is 
It is super easy to get to in Fridley. Uh, it's, it's right off 694, like a hop, skip, and a jump. And it is in the most like crazy nondescript place that you would think of having a craft brewery. And then, I mean, I'll tell you, you get past that, that big gray building that, it, and it looks, you know, it's, that's a fancy new building, right? And that thing's got to be, yeah. you know, 150,000 square feet itself. You're tucked behind that. And it is like little Shangri-La back there for, yeah. for craft beer drinkers. I'm like, no brainer to go and visit that place. Yep. Yeah. It, Get dude. a hold of it. I mean, fo follow us on Instagram. We're always uh, updating stuff there. So forgot Star, at Forgotten Star Brewing. Uh, myself personally, feel free to send me an email anytime. It's andy at fsbc.beer. Um, we do corporate events, we do private birthday parties, we do weddings, um, and we just do you know your typical happy hours too. So all are welcome. We're open at noon every single day. Uh, yesterday and Monday, we had 20 people show up right at noon and open up their laptops and started working from the brewery. So Sweet. we, we want to be open to all and uh, you don't even have to buy beer from us. Just come and hang out in a great space and uh, enjoy your time. Yeah, a little co-working space almost like that, right? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I love it. Uh, so I kind of alluded to this in the opening, but um, you know, I think in the conversations you and I have had, you do a lot more of the day-to-day -day than, than you had intended to when you started this business, but it's taken on a life of its own also too. Yep. Um, I know you have this, this constant entrepreneurial itch. Um, what, is, what, is the, what does the future hold for you without giving away too much, I guess? <laughs> It's a good question. Uh, some version of, so the, I, I reflected on this a lot recently, uh, but some version of helping other business owners uh, achieve joy and success. Um, and when you boil that down as to like why, like wh where, the, where the problem is, ultimately the, I came to the thought of how many, how many great ideas have never come to the market and how many world changing ideas have been just stuck in somebody's chest or brain because they're too afraid to take the leap. And one of the reasons they're too afraid to take the leap is because they see, they see scared, nervous, unhappy business owners. And they say, I got this great idea, but I am not doing what they're doing. They look miserable. Where, where instead they saw a world full of joyful, successful, happy business owners, they would bring that idea to the market and literally change the world. There's world changing ideas that have not been brought to market because people are too afraid to do it. Yeah. Um, and I want, I want to help business owners find that joint success. So they in turn create more business owners. All right, good. Well, um, I'm excited to see where that takes you. I think, uh, you know, your energy and, and the success that you've had and how you could have that same, uh, that same impact on people and have even the part of that rub off on people, I think could be a, a fantastic, um, thing that we need, not only in our community, but in society in general. Absolutely. Yeah, man. Um, well, you know, you couldn't do all of this crazy shit uh, in your career without a, a, a loving family that that supports you. So uh, one of the things I want to make sure and let you give a shout out to your family. So and I'm talking about like your immediate family. So, you, you know, your wife and kid kids yeah. uh, soon. So um, talk about uh, what's your family dynamic? I have a uh, very supportive wife, uh, Nicole. Um, the, what she put up with in 2019, it blows my mind. Like, oh, start a new clinic, sure. Oh, start a brewery, sure. Let's have a baby, sure. Yeah, it was what she put up with is mind blowing. Um, but she's super supportive. Uh, she's a huge fan, um, and I'm lucky enough to support her too. We have a daughter, Reese. She was born, like I said, the month before the brewery opened, uh, October of 20, 2019. Uh, and then my wife is almost 30 weeks pregnant, uh, 28 weeks pregnant now. Uh, with our second so she'll that baby i don't know if it's a boy or girl will be born uh september of this year sweet good congratulations yeah, yeah. super are, super lucky things are moving fast man um yeah. well congratulations on all your success um you shared how people can get a hold of you uh i'm going to share all of that stuff in our show notes so people can uh can figure out how to connect with you okay here's a few more of our supporters united healthcare believes there's no limit to what care can do UHC is continually focused on building a modern, high-performing health system via improved access, affordability, outcomes, and experiences. With a network of over 1.3 million care professionals and 6,500 hospitals and care facilities, United Healthcare is dedicated to connecting you to better health by offering quality benefits designed for affordability. Go to UHC.com for healthcare plans, resources, and more information. United Healthcare. 
helping people live healthier lives. If you're anything like me, you know enough to be dangerous when it comes to finance, yet need some help when things are complicated. All-in-One Accounting provides the right financial expertise and leadership to align with your stage of growth. From outsourced accounting and bookkeeping to strategic financial planning, the team of accounting rock stars at All-in-One Accounting are passionate about positively impacting the lives of their clients. Check them out at allinoneaccounting.com. All-in-One Accounting, taking our clients from financial chaos to business clarity and beyond. The topic of talent is hot in organizations of any size, and I would argue none more than small to mid-sized businesses. That's why it's crucial to have a partner to help you navigate all the HR idiosyncrasies so you can focus on working on your business and not in it. Insperity is a full-service HR partner with a high-touch, high-tech platform helping owners work through challenges like employee retention, company culture, and benefits, just to name a few. Do yourself a favor and explore all they have to offer at Insperity.com. Insperity. HR that makes a difference. When you think of a typical CPA firm, you probably think of tax planning. Well, that just scratches the surface of what Boulay offers their clients. By providing smart, in-depth thinking from experts in accounting, audit, tax, and business consulting, they know what it takes to achieve financial success. Whether it's protecting your business, building your wealth, or securing your future, you can count on Boulay to go beyond addressing just financial matters and providing you with tailor-made, workable solutions. Learn about all they have to offer at BoulayGroup.com. Boulay, helping you get there. And back to the show. Let's transition into nine questions so people can really Sweet. get to know you at the next level. <laughs> the, the, let's, let's get a little weird here. Uh, can you confirm to me uh, that you have no idea what I'm about to ask you? I can confirm. I have no clue what you're about to ask me. All right. Are you excited? Yes. Nervous right. excited. <laughs> Good. Good. I love when people say that because people people always say that, and that's what it's all about. Good. All right. Question one. I'm giving you. I'm giving you a soft toss here. Uh, what was your first concert? Oh man, Britney Spears, eighth grade. Grandparents brought me bought me and my twin sister tickets. It was phenomenal. Thirty rows up. It was awesome. Did you? <laughs> uh, did who opened for Britney? No clue. Yeah, no clue. No. I was an eighth grade boy watching Britney Spears. I didn't care who opened. <laughs> did you? Did your grandparents go with you? No, they. Uh, how'd that work? I think we just got dropped off, and my parents went out to dinner or something, and we came back. But it was yeah, that was my first concert with my twin yeah. sister. <laughs> I love it. That's sweet. Uh, yeah. What is what is one guilty pleasure that you uh, indulge in? Oh, binge watching a show, Get, finding something like Ozarks on Netflix, and just going three hours straight. Yeah right? It's awesome. Uh, yeah. Good. Uh, is that your wait, Ozark is good, isn't it? Like what, what Great. is, yeah, is oh that the most God. recent one? That, uh, better call Saul. I binged too a little bit. That was, uh, that's also great. Yeah. Those are, those are the most, the two, two most recent. Are you a stranger things fan? No, no, I haven't watched it. All right. All right. That, well, I'm just going to tell you like from the start <laughs> to, to like, if you, if you can get into it and if you like that kind of like eighties sci-fi stuff, it, yep. it'll suck you in and it, it will not let you go until you finish that whole thing. Damn, it's good. All right. I, I better be uh, careful. Yeah, I know. Uh, wait till the fall or something like that when it gets yeah. a little cooler and you have to be inside. Uh, okay, I digress. Uh, if I were to ask uh, your best friend what you were the most known for, what would that person say? Uh, I would, probably the brewery, I guess. I don't know. It's I, I don't know. I, I would probably say the brewery. All right. Cool. All right, well, then that's a good thing to be aligned with. Right? Yeah. All right. Um, what three things would you, t- what three things, so you, you a, a human cannot count and, and a dog or a cat cannot count. So, so inanimate objects, uh, what three things would you take with you on a des- deserted island? Three things on a deserted island. I would take, man, Aaron, these are tough. Oh, come on. Just three. I would take, uh, I'd take a radio for sure. I would take, I would take, uh, some version of a, some good book. Uh, I'm not sure what it would be. And I would take a fishing pole. There you go. I would fish and listen. I would fish and listen. I'd probably take a beer actually too. Get rid of the book. I'll grab me a beer. I'll fish, drink a beer and listen to the radio. All right. 
Good. Well, if fish, you're going to be able to survive if you take your fishing pole. If you're any good at fishing, you'll be able to continue. It just sounds like a good vacation. It sounds like a good vacation. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I never, I never really said how long you'd be out there. So that's true. So good. I like the radio and the fishing pole thing. The beer, the beer, if it's one, that better be one big beer, because if you're just having one beer, that is like, that's the, that's, that sounds like no fun having one beer. Yeah, no, it'd, it'd have to be big. You're right. <laughs> a, big, a big growler from forgot. Yeah. Um, what time do you wake up and what time do you go to bed? Uh, typically like 530 ish and 930. So yeah. some of that's dictated with the kiddo, but generally right around 530 and then in bed by 930, fall asleep, I don't know, 10 ish. Oh, you and I could go on vacation together because that is almost exactly my, my time. It's perfect. Yeah. I love it. I'm like, I'm like, I'm more five to nine, but, uh, I can adapt for you. Uh, all right. What is your superpower? One. Oh yeah. I, so I, I have a superpower now. I didn't look at it as a superpower before, but a buddy from coalition nine actually calls it his superpower. Truly think it's, uh, I don't mean to, I don't want this to sound negative in any way, but I truly think it's ADHD. Like I, I have incredible, I have a ton of energy. Um, I, a ton of my brain's always going little hamster wheel up there. But when you look at it as a superpower, you realize how lucky you are to have it. There's, there's a lot of people who crave this kind of energy and crave those ideas. Um, but I'm lucky enough that I was born with it. So uh, it's a superpower on one hand. And on the other hand, if you don't know how to control it, it can be a little bit of a detriment. But I look at it as a superpower now. I think every superpower is like that. And um, so yeah. I, I'm going to say this because uh, you may or may not know this, but Ross Hogland was on our podcast. He talked about, he talked about it in depth about how that's his superpower. Uh, and so he's I'm an really incredible person. He, that. he is an incredible person and he's doing some pretty incredible things. So um, if you want to look yep. back and hear more about the perspective that he shares on on, and I'm talking to the listener, not to you, but I think you know this, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. but people should go back and listen to the Ross Hogland uh, episode because he does talk about ADHD as being a superpower and why, and kind of does a really good job just find it. So it's great that yep. you two, and you two are in the same group. And so I think that yep. really helps um, from a, just a support standpoint of like dealing with some of the challenges and turning those challenges into opportunities and looking at it from a positive perspective. I love that. That's awesome. Good, good. Uh, what piece of technology will change the world? Oh my gosh, uh, AI, Every, anything AI. So, yeah. I mean, yeah, the cars driving themselves one day to Northern Minnesota is gonna change property values where in Northern Minnesota because cabins are all of a sudden gonna be four hour drive that you're doing yourself to a four hour ride watching a movie with your kid. Like, okay. I think AI is gonna change everything. Yeah. That's just one stupid example, but I mean, you can just see where it trickles everywhere. Well, I just think too, like, you know, uh, your phone and, and, you know, the algorithms that are built into that, yep. that all tie back to AI. Yeah. I think AI, um, it's interesting how, when I ask that question, how people get a little bit more finite in what their answer is, where I think actually at the end of the day, all the answers that I've ever gotten to that question have all came back to artificial intelligence. If you were to really just unpack them all. So, uh, yeah. that's a very good answer. Uh, where do you come up with your best ideas? Uh, either on a, like a jog or a walk around the lake. It's like, I, I can't, or a drive. I mean, if whenever my brain is free to, and not inundated with outside input. Yeah. So. Yeah. There's a really great book that I read uh, many years ago that uh, if people really are trying maybe have brain block or or writer's block or are having a hard time coming up with creative new ideas it's called the net and the butterfly and in that they spend mm -hmm. a whole chapter on talking about how some of the greatest inventors um uh thomas edison for example he got all of his best ideas from walking and um, it's because your body is so focused on putting one step in front of the other that it allows you to free up the, the, that space in your brain to where your, your, your motor skills are kicking in and your brain is focused on, on that, that act of walking to where it allows your subconscious to come up with the creativity ideas. That's very wise. Yeah, I, that's, where I, that's where I think a lot of people get their best ideas is through movement. I agree. Yep. Uh, okay. Last question. And this is a big one. Uh, how do you define happiness? How do you define oh my happiness? Gosh. Yeah. Um, I define happiness through success, through, through seeing, through having a plan, through having something as little as the curling tournament 
uh, or a relationship and having a, like a date night saying, I want this to happen because of these actions I've taken and then having that thing happen. Uh, that's how, that's where happiness comes from for me is the success of a, of a thought out plan. Yeah. Good. Seeing, seeing an idea come to fruition. Exactly. Yeah. yeah I love it. How, how do you answer that question? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm more on the side of like, uh, I just let happiness happen. Right. So I think, mm. um, sometimes I, so not setting too high of expectations is part of what makes me happy. I think, you know, staying humble, I think is really keeps me happy because then, um, if something doesn't work out, then I don't feel like my, my ego is crushed. We all yeah. have egos. Right. And so I think, it, you know, I, uh, my, now that answer has changed drastically for me in the last five years, because I think I've went through so many different iterations from my personal and slash business life to where, and I also think life experience helps guide some of those things too. So yeah. my answer may be a little bit different a year from now, and it may be a di different uh, a year ago. So yeah, I think it all kind of, it should, all, it should always be shifting. It should always, it should always be shifting. Amen, yep. brother. Yeah. Uh, that was great, man. Like, I am so happy that I was able to get you like last week's or two weeks ago. Uh, so this is going to drop here, uh, at the, at the end of June, uh, early July. And I was at breakfast with Rob Redding and we were talking about, I don't know, coalition nine stuff. And then, uh, I'm like, all right, well, I got to get, get you on the podcast. And then you're sitting over there and I'm like, what the <laughs> hell are you doing here? Well, you need to be on the podcast too. So we just get you locked and well. loaded. Yeah. Right. Just back to back. And, and I'll tell you something, you, you, um, more people need to know who you are. Like I, and, and I think, um, the things that you're doing with the brewery and then what you've done in the past, uh, with, with in chiropractic, that's one aspect, but I think just the energy that you bring and your personality and how you bring such a heart centered approach, um, you're just a good human being. And, and that's, yeah. it's to, having people in our community, coalition and community that are, that are uh, wired like you is only going to make it better. And I love being able to build it around people like you. Uh, I appreciate that's really sweet of you to say, but what I'll go right back with you though. And I'm sure you hear this all the time, but what you built with coalition nine is really, really important that our, I can only speak to our group specifically, but the stories that our group shares, I, what you've done is essentially created this, like, I don't know, we essentially give each other a big virtual hug every day and a huge, huge real hug every month and we support each other and it's it's really cool. You've created something really neat. Well, and you know, you guys as you guys are the co-presidents of that group and you have to create that space. And so cheers to you guys for being vulnerable and transparent. And <laughs> I'm more just kind of like your Sherpa, just kind of getting you there. And then you guys got to take it and run with it. So you've created a hell of a group there. Yeah, we're lucky. Yeah, you are. Uh, all right, man. Thanks a lot for being on the show. Uh, I'm going to wrap uh, on behalf of Andy Rizvold. This has been the Power of Nine podcast. I am your host, Aaron Eggert, and I want to thank you for the privilege of your time. Mm -hmm.